the idea of this, this talk is not actually to challenge any of the engineering part, um, parts of, of this industry that you might know. Um, this talk is here to provoke you into thinking about um, education and things we do with education and the paradigms that we apply to education. And I like to start this talk with a simple raise of hands. How many of you went to school? And it would be silly if, if someone wouldn't actually raise their hands. But how many of you actually think about education and reforming education once a month? Yes. Um, so a bit of background about me uh, before I start this talk. Um, so I started developing Zamfir as this archetype of a new school because I had experience with um, educational startups. I work with uh, educational startups and ed tech startups. I used to advi advise capital funds and startups around these things and policymakers around education. And in my spare time, um, I do a lot of work with free uh, software and with free culture. And if any of you use Linux as your desktop or any other free software, you're seeing how predominant it's becoming today and how many of these things actually are now taking over the industry one by one. So in my, um, as, my, as part of my work, I do uh, work on moonshots and transformative projects, and Zamfit is actually one of them, so you'll be able to see that um, today. If you go to the website, zamfit.com, you'll actually be able to see that. It's not broken, it's actually a website. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll try this like that. Um, education 1.0. When I say education 1.0 and school 2.0, forgive the buzzwords, it's just simple uh, to actually visualize these things. Um, education 1.0, what is it? It's this current system of education that we have right now. So you're basically, you know, uh, you go into school and then you have, you know, elementary school, high school, um, either college or vocational studies, and then you're out. And when you're out, you ask yourself, okay, what am I supposed to do right now? And people from academia usually say, well, it's up to you now, we don't care. Um, you went through this whole cycle with us, right? Um, and when you think about education, the best thing to think about is, is this really the best thing that we can do? Look at the world right now and how transformative technology has become and how it transformed the society and the way we live. Um, so we still have educational systems that are way behind from 19th century, um, even some older than that. And if you think where you learn, most of our, our knowledge comes from things like experiences, talking with other people, you know, sharing information, and it's mostly non-institutional. And I have a theory, and I agree with um, Isa Kasimov, but I have a theory that you can't really teach anyone anything. You can just facilitate access to knowledge or maybe show patterns, but the person actually has to learn for themselves. There is no way to put something in someone's brain, right? So we have this concept of you know, teaching other people something, but it's really not what's happening. You're just helping people realize uh, and get to that, like glue between the, their synapses. Um, so what do we have in this current educational system? Um, you, you say you wanna educate children, right? Or young people about the world, about challenges, about needs and then you isolate them from this world, put them in a concrete box and say, you're gonna spend 12 years here or maybe more. And that's really counterproductive because now the only world that they can do and they can learn about is that classroom, right? Um, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you think about classrooms today, you have something that's called cult of the average. Um, the cult of the average is if you go into a classroom, there's a teacher, and they look at the kids they're teaching to. So if you have 30 kids, you have to figure out who's the middle one and use that as a point of reference to actually um, give lectures and start teaching these kids because you have to be you know, somewhere in the middle for everyone to get, be able to keep track and uh, follow on. So in this technological world today, we do have mechanisms with machine learning, with a lot of these technologies, with UX, which can be adapted to personalize a lot of these things, yet we don't use them at all with offline schools. So um, some traits are, it's 
school 1.0 or conventional schools are actually not very agile. If you look at it, try changing a uh, curricula. Try changing this and ask people, how long is this going to take? How long do we need to actually add something to this plan, right? Um, it uses a lot of um, offline first methods, which are pretty good if you're you know, working with things different in tech. But it's really not adaptable. It's really not personalizable. Um, you, can't, you, you, know, you can't direct your attention to only one child in a classroom, right? So this is, this is a huge problem. And one of the bigger issues is that you have this fragmented knowledge. So if you look at teachers who come in every day and find their own resources on things like um, anything that they teach, maths, tech, uh, science, whatever, um, they spend their time and they do their work uh, to actually get to a certain resource. And once they get it, they spread it amongst their class and once they're done, it's just stuck there, right? So they're not sharing with other teachers. We're not merging this knowledge globally. Now, that doesn't seem very radical, but if you look at how many these teachers do we have in one country, thousands of them spending the, their time producing knowledge that someone maybe somewhere actually already did. So they're overlapping all the time, right? Um, so this fragmentation is, is very bad for this day and age because we have technology that can actually prevent us from doing that. Um, when internet came into use like widely, uh, people started thinking, okay, we're gonna do something about this. And everybody asked, okay, what are you gonna do? We're gonna sell books online because we don't know what to do, right? And the 90s basically you know, went by with that idea in mind. Let's just sell physical things online. And then in 2000s, um, you know, smart people in universities actually thought to themselves, let's provide a legal framework for people to actually share content. And that's how we got OERs um, and open access. And I'm going to get to that later. Uh, but there is a legal framework for you to actually license your work, your research, or anything else, and just spread it amongst people. And then in 2010s, uh, we got MOOCs, Coursera, edX, a lot of these things that are now basically defunct or not being used um, as much as they did 10 years ago. Um, so what's the problem? Why didn't this catch up? What do we have this divide between internet and education? We have internet in our societies for 20, 30 years, but yeah, education hasn't just picked up. So it's because usually online education is not really online. Um, usually all of these things are actually made uh, to mimic offline education. So you put this classroom and you just make these little dots and there's this virtual classroom and we're just learning now. While the only good thing about offline education now is that social interaction, you need people, you need to actually talk to people and share experiences and you know, have emotions about things um, to actually you know, get something valuable out of this offline communication. Yeah, we're, we're not doing that in online. Uh, so in a sense, that's uh, an opportunity missed. OERs, how many of you has actually went to a college or universities? And how many of you actually use OERs? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> so OERs are basically textbooks that are free and open to use. So you don't have to pay for them. You can just download them and you know, read them on your tablet or anything else. So um, every university in, in the European Union ha actually has um, op uh, open educational resources or they produce them even. So it's very possible that the university that you went to has an OER section, but you just don't know it. And if you don't know it, people who actually went to college, academic people, um, how is that supposed to get into the masses, right? People who don't participate actively in the educational system or you know, don't go to that higher education uh, part of that system. The problem with them is if you think about it, it's only a legal framework. And when we started doing that, people started writing these things and then realized, okay, this costs a lot of time and a lot of money. Who's going to fund this? And then EU, of course, said, well, we're going to fund this. We're the good guys, right? So people started saying, okay, if you're funding this, I'm going to work. But if you're not funding this, I'm not going to work. I'm going to wait for the next project cycle. So people stop working on OERs unless they're funded. 
And then EU, in its you know, infinite wisdom, started paying for campaigns to actually raise awareness about writing OERs. And now you have this you know, cycle of people who are actually just you know, producing this content on a project-wide basis, and it's not really sustainable, and it's not really discoverable. So people outside of college, or in college, or in universities don't get the access to it. Um, so what's the problem with MOOCs? And people usually ask me, well, what's your beef with MOOCs? Um, so I actually spent some time on Coursera and learned uh, a lot of things there. But MOOCs are not sustainable. They started with this good idea, let's provide free education to anyone, and we're going to have top universities share their knowledge with us, and it makes a lot of sense. Except on the long run, universities don't have, um, don't have any agenda on that. They don't have the resources for it. And this dynamic was not even sustainable in a short term with retention. So usually people got these courses for free, and they just drop off after 10%. So in the end, MOOCs had to do the, the, the thing that we expected them to do. They started charging for things. They started charging for courses. They started start charging for certificates. And now you have this very similar to what you have in your local communities, schools that pay, you pay to get a certificate and you just get vocational training, uh, which is essentially what they are right now. So in a sense, you know, if you look at education and you look at the ideas that we have about education, we've changed so much as a society and we've changed so much as an individuals, right? Uh, we have personal computing units with us every day and we use it all the time. Your mobile phones are very powerful machines. Uh, yet we haven't like picked up on this most profoundly, um, this, this deep, deeply rooted, um, education that's, that's, you know, going throughout the society. It's very integral to our society, and if you need to change this, you have to think a bit bolder. So this was not brave enough. So how do we change this? Now we're getting somewhere. Um, so we know that these things are not really great, but I think that we don't need an actual revolution to actually do something. We don't need someone to come and say, we're building this product, right? Um, we already have technological uh, means of doing it. We just have to change the way we're applying this technology to education. Um, education 2.0, yes, it sounds like a buzzword, but I'm going to get to that. Um, it's actually a set of this principles, and it, it's not only applied to content per se, it's applied to technology, applied to pedagogy, and uh, it's a philosophical movement in a sense, where you know, we're tailoring this new paradigm of how we do, how we, how we do schools, right? how we instantiate schools, how we build things. Um, so why is free education a bad thing to say? Uh, because there's a lot of for-profit entities who are actually profiting from education. Um, a lot of big corporations are actually selling you the right to know something. And this is uh, a very bad thing because now we have the internet and we can get this information wherever we want. So why did we allow people to actually lock us out of this uh, information? Um, and this is going to be a slow change, but it's attainable. Free software has managed to do that and, uh, you know, across 30 years, so I think the free education can, can do that too. So one idea is, let's not profit from education. Let's not sell people access to knowledge. Uh, we can profit still from, you know, reaping the, the benefits of good education. If you are uh, teaching someone how to code, you can actually benefit from that by having them employed in your company or, you know, helping someone be an um, intermediary and in, in them getting a job and you getting percentage or something like that. So there is always this economic model that you can exploit, but it doesn't have to be, you know, charging someone to get knowledge. Um, and another thing is, if you look at... Um, Universities like Harvard or you know, Stanford, uh, a lot of them, by participating in these MOOCs and platforms online, try to set up this competitive economy. And this competitive e economy actually has a downside to it. They're not sh sharing knowledge. They're competing against each other, and knowledge is the one that's getting fragmented and that's, that's suffering, right? So if we start denouncing competition in this sense, because this is a digital asset, we're not actually spending our material um, wealth to build this, we can actually um, start building a post-scarcity society with this. So how do we approach it? 
if you think about school, you always have these two things. Um, one is you're taught in a school for the sole purpose of actually getting to the next part of education. So in high school, you're like, learn to get into college. And in college, you're like, learn to get into masters and masters to PhDs. And you're like, okay, what, what's after that? And after that, it's like, <laughs> well, now you're out. We don't care. Um, and then the second thing is um, you, you're being taught for the sole purpose of actually being valuable to an employer, right? So you're being trained to be a part of the workforce. And it's never for the sole benefit of actually being you know, a better human being. That's why we have education. That's the, the whole point of mass education is to actually build a better society, build a society uh, you know, of better capacities. And yet we don't do that with this education. Uh, so I think that we need to focus on people more. And we do that by actually building education that's a public resource. So if you look at free software, that's the same thing that we're doing with free software. You're basically writing something, uh, you know, opening it, liberating it with, you know, legally and with your, your own moral rights, and then you're just giving to people. Use this, you know, that I, I've shared this with you, that's my knowledge, that's my work, and we thrive on these things. So if we apply the same principle to education, we can actually thrive on that, um, on, on new education as a society much more than we can do with software. Um, so what should we really do about School 2.0? And here are some you know, basic traits. So first of all, I, I believe that uh, we need to employ things like crowdsourcing. And I usually take Wikipedia as a good example. Wikipedia is a good example of crowdsourcing and it's a bad example of information correctness or peer review or whatever. Um, so if you look at crowdsourcing, we have people who have actually contributed massively to a, to a platform like Wikipedia. So I think that we can actually manage a similar thing and have people contribute to a singular uh, knowledge corpus about technology, about programming, about design, about all of these things. And we can then keep it free, both as in freedom and as in money. Uh, and we can, we can do a lot of these things like personalization, adaptation, because now we have an actual technological uh, framework to actually work with. So now this is digital and we have a lot of digital tools that we can use. Uh, one of the most important thing is we need to keep this new school free of curricula, right? If you have an agenda, you're basically telling people, I believe or we believe or this authority believes that this knowledge is the only thing that you'll need in this society. While, you know, if you look at people, if you look at painters, most of them just started painting and are not academic painters. And if you look at people who are actually, you know, applying to hobbies or skills or something like that, it's usually not the things that they've learned in school. Um, and if you look at curriculums in, in current education, things like how do you feed yourself and how you make food are not part of them. So there's no way that these uh, things that we're learning at school today are the only things that we're going to need. Um, universality is, of, of course, applied. Uh, because I think that, you know, everyone should have the right to, you know, be taught in their native language and, you know, with their um, cultural, cultural uh, specificities in mind. Um, so the ideal implementation, how many of you use free software, any piece of free software? Impressive. <laughs> uh, so if you think about open source projects and free software project, you're going to see this consistency uh, with them. One is they're very good with infrastructure and very light on resources, and they're very good in governance, but they fail on sustainability. So you're going to have people who are dedicated and who uh, dedicate a lot of time to this project, and they manage it you know, decently, sometimes even excellently, but you still have a problem with sustainability. How do they get the money to actually work on this? And I think that the goal of this implementation should be finding a sustainable economical model for us to actually have free education, uh, unlike what Wikipedia does with, with the encyclopedia, uh, relying only on that, uh, on the donation part. So these challenges are very, you know, particular to, to the implementation. If we want to build a new school, a new paradigm school, we're going to have a problem with sustainability, of course. And then you're going to have this core infrastructure. While people think, usually listening to me, this person is either very insane or very smart. I can assure you they're not insane. <laughs> because if you think about free software again, 
this core infrastructure is very uh, simple to do because you only need one. And that's the part of fragmentation that I was talking about uh, before with, uh, with conventional schools. If you build one learning environment and share it as free software, anyone anywhere in the world can actually use it. If you build one um, you know, AI mentor and release it as free software, anyone anywhere in the world can actually use it or adapt it and remix it, whatever, but they can use it. So you only need one of these things. Uh, and then, of course, there is adoption. Um, this is a huge idea, and it's not supposed to happen you know, soon or often, because um, there, there needs to we need to have this very uh, radical change of ways, and with education being what it is right now, it's, it's probably not going to happen very soon, but it's very attainable. Um, of course, we do have different problems. If you think about digital literacy, for example, how many people do you know that actually think they know how to use a computer, but really they don't? Uh, people who say, you know, in their CVs, I know how to use Microsoft Word, then I can, you know, I can do email and I click a mouse and sometimes, and it's, you know, I can do it, it I'm, I'm good with computers. And usually have a lot of these people who are basically trained to do only one singular thing, a uh, task, and that's where their scope of knowledge uh, is kind of done. And then things that we have, you know, take for granted, like access to electricity, access to the internet. Uh, you know, many people don't have the access to electricity, and of course, then in, in the best possible scenario, they're, they're left with mobile internet in a third world country. Uh, so these are all the things that we need to think about, especially with the ethics of technology. If you've, ha if you've heard any of the recent talks about AI, you're going to see how difficult ethics around technology and about machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence is, and that's only one part of this vast industry where we have. You know, other is data sharing or, you know, opening data, you know, who controls your data and, and how, you know, how privacy is managed online. So we do have a lot of ethical questions in technology that are not really related to, to this education. So, okay, uh, a base model. So in the governance part, you, you're going to have something very similar to what you have with uh, free software projects. And, you know, you have standards, you have committees, you have people who have different set of principles and they apply it. Very similar to what you have in local Wikipedia communities, right? People who apply themselves, you know, using their standards uh, to, to get this to a certain point in their community and to govern that community. Uh, the other part is the infrastructure, and that's where we get to the interesting part. And this is what we, you know, we don't do now in schools, which is a problem. Uh, so we have software. If we build educational software and commit it to free education, um, we can actually reuse that in any school. And if we build open knowledge corpuses, we can actually have people from different places of the world contributing to one singular um, knowledge repo and just sharing it. And that's the same thing that we do with Wikipedia, but not apply to education. And then, of course, there's, there's data. And now, you know, we can manage a lot of, like, behavioral data. We can manage a lot of these things. And, you know, using that data, we can actually tailor better experiences, measure outcomes, help people learn better by having the data that they provide and using it to optimize learning. So if I would leave you at that, you would just say, okay, this guy doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. So I've actually spent three years working on this. And um, very much uh, like Richard Stallman did uh, with free software, I wanted to make an archetype of this. I wanted to actually dedicate my time to actually try and implement um, the things that I'm promoting. And I built, I started building this archetype of a school 2.0. It's called Zomfit, and it's very dedicated toward technology um, and computer science. So what are my goals with that? Uh, one is to build an actual free corpus of knowledge. The, the thing that I was mentioning previously, the, the place where everyone can actually go add or read uh, things about technology, programming, design, and contribute to it. And we can just have this, you know, constantly growing uh, asset that's helping us learn. Uh, this is also a project where we want to test sustainability. Is this really sustainable? I mean, I've been working on this for three years, so I think it's pretty much sustainable. But is it sustainable on a, on a larger um, in a larger scope, right, with, with more people. The goal here is actually to provide free education for the whole humanity, so 7.7 billion people. And it's not going to be easy to do, but um, this is the project that we, we uh, you know, are looking, looking into testing on this. And of course, 
most of our time is basically dedicated to building software that's going to be used as, as free school infrastructure. So tomorrow, you know, in, in, in any time in the future, we're going to have schools saying, do you have learning environment software that we can use or e-learning or LMSs or something like that? And we're going to say, yes, you know, we've built something for you and you can use it, you can add to it, you can adapt it any way you like. So what, what have we actually built? Um, the idea of this is not to actually be entrapped in one uh, way of learning. So we do have uh, both offline learning environments and principles around that, and we have virtual learning environments. Um, you know, applications you can go into learn, it's a completely digital setting. Um, we have an identity platform, so anyone using any school in free education can use another school with their ID. And we have data and we have uh, a data APIs and, you know, different APIs to access all of this data that's being produced by people who are learning, either behavioral, you know, statistical, any of these things. And of course, we're actually trying to get people to experiment with this and do peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, offline learning, instantiate schools with different pedagogy in mind, so we can actually see uh, what the outcomes are and what's working, what's not working. Uh, so now we have this school model. So you have the part where we, you know, we have the governments and infrastructure, but now you have the school part. And you have a learning environment, you have software, which is powering that learning environment. And on, on top of that, we've actually built a school as a platform, right? So now you have an API, which commercial or for-profit entities can actually use to, you know, build services or goods around that. You have a, you have a, data, um, a data set, uh, which is open data, which is the school is producing, and then you have the identity platform. So this is kind of the idea around uh, uh, school 2.0. This is an ideal implementation of a digital, in a digital setting. So what can we actually do with this? Is this like, uh, is this like a, a pipe dream or something? Uh, we've actually tried building new things and different approaches around this and the data that we have. One being algo-generated paths. So imagine if you have a thousand people learning and some of them are failing and some of them are doing good. So what we actually tried doing is we tracked them through their learning, found breaking points or you know, found crucial uh, data, data points in that uh, whole timeline. And we started thinking about are these things important and do we need to have these things? So by building this, we can actually tell you now uh, if you want to learn something like JavaScript, the best way to do it is actually this way because more people have had success with it. And not only that, we, we don't just provide that as information, we can actually tailor the experience of learning, say, if many of the people have failed using videos, we're just going to stop showing you videos and then we're going to tailor this experience to improve their outcomes. Uh, another thing that we started building, and it's very important, is a smart document. So the way we structure and the way we write down data, uh, information, sorry, uh, and the content is fairly limited in, in today's world. One is, you know, we use HTML. Um, the other is we use Markdown. And then you have these conventional document types that, you know, most of you know, like DocX or ODF or things like that. Uh, yet, if you want to have a live notebook and have people actually run their code inside a document, you would probably have only one solution, and that's Jupyter Notebooks. What the problem is Jupyter Notebooks uses a client-server um, architecture, which means that you always have to be connected, and all these things have to happen, and you have kernels, and then there's a lot of um, you know, granularity around that. And another thing is we don't have linked data. So imagine how many people hours we actually had on Wikipedia. How many of these people have actually contributed these are millions and millions of hours, yet this data is not linked to anything else. So what we started building is this format, which has an autonomous virtual machine inside the document. So you can actually run code with these executors, and you can actually get different uh, features for it. One being, you can actually link data to a different document that's a different autonomous container outside of it. And by actually you know, just writing down this text in a convenient editor, you're actually providing us with structured data, with linked data that we can use to build a knowledge graph. And a knowledge graph, if you looked at things like Wolfram Alpha, uh, were magic 10 years ago. And now many of these people are actually, you know, just, yeah, it's, it's okay, no? 
uh, we, can, we can do it better now. With linked data, uh, with Sparkle and a lot of these technologies, we can actually build uh, this as free software too. Uh, a few more things that we did. One is uh, pretty interesting to kids. It's basically an implementation that's called Alexa Read to Me. So we build a skill, Alexa takes a lesson and just starts reading it, annotates, uh, you know, has different remarks depending on how data is linked in this format. So th that's a nice didactic tool. Uh, one thing that we wanted to do is to actually have, and this is one of the longer term projects, is to actually have machines generate content for people. It seems far reaching, but we can actually have an engine that you ask a question and without having data about the question, the bot would essentially go to the internet and just look for things while satisfying your basic um, you know, criteria heuristics or something like that. So these are all implementations that we can now have because we have the data and we're doing this in a digital setting, which was virtually impossible to do in an, in an offline setting. Um, and there's, there's more things that people can build on top of this, uh, some even commercial. Um, with the industry being what it is, it's very hard to get to talent in this current talent pool. So if you're a recruiter, you're basically you know, looking at the market and just you know, are either trying to poach people or you know, basically just you know, asking around, seeing if there's talent available. Um, a lot of companies are going so far as to look outside of their local communities and just hire people from different countries, flying them in, relocating them. And this is what we have. With this, we can actually have, as a platform, the, the school as a platform, we can actually have companies build products on top of a school. So it would be as if in an offline school you'd have this recruiter sitting in your university just monitoring you all the time. It's pretty weird, it's, it's a weird dynamic, but in an online uh, setting, in a digital setting, you can actually build a recruitment tool for this, a job um, searching portal, whatever. Of course, you, you, know, you have bots and bots and bots, and a lot of these things can be automated to, uh, through bots that are very simple to build. And of course, there are mentoring marketplaces, so people who want to sell you time to actually debug your code, give you advice, things like that, that these are like the social interactions that you can't really get just by looking at a lesson. So there is a lot of space for actual commercialization. And of course, um, recruitment companies are very excited about this because now they can actually have uh, meaningful data around who uses what on what project, how long have they been exposed to a certain technology. These are, these are metrics that could never be possible with a conventional CV or you know, information that you do give to um, recruiters right now. So uh, there is certainly a space for commercialization. So finally, if you look at this, now we have this complete federation model. So we started from governance infrastructure, we built this digital school, and now we have an ecosystem, a federation of people providing goods and services on top of that school, which is unimaginable in today's world, yet it's so elegant um, and, and simple in a, in a final sense. Um, the biggest problem here, of course, is to implement uh, corpuses and software. But for-profit uh, providers can actually benefit from APIs and things that schools implement because, because they can now access um, this um, talent pool and schools can actually take this money, take it downstream and use it to actually be sustainable. So we now built this economy model um, which is you know, a microcosm of, of, um, of a school. They get money, they fund uh, their you know, future work and everyone are happy. So you have a win-win situation. So this is actually a free software, this is not a product. So what we want to do as a movement, we actually want to have people join in. So if you're anyone who can advocate this to governments or you know, industry stakeholders, um, just feel free to ping me afterwards. And of course, if you have legal experience, that's always start, uh, hard to do because you know, we do tackle this worldwide so different jurisdictions have different uh, challenges that we have to face. And it's very similar to other projects like this. So uh, Wikipedia also has uh, a different set of challenges like this. And of course, if you want to contribute to content, um, you know, you're always free to do that. Um, we do have different um, ways of participating. One is to actually help us build Zomfit, and another one is called Dragonfly, which is basically an apprenticeship. So if you're a junior or something, um, you can actually get into building free software for education as a part of your internship or a part of your you know, um, university days you know, for credit or whatever. And if you want to talk to us, just simply around the, the idea, you can actually use these handles. So if you're using Matrix or Riot, you can use Zomfir. 
Um, and of course, recently we've added an IRC. People from uh, Freenode were good enough to give us a handle, so now we have an official IRC channel too. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to leave you to ask any questions if you have any. Uh, thank you very much.